Well, thank you so much, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you about DuckDB. We're covering in-process analytical data management using DuckDB. As you may have guessed, I am not Hannes Muehlheisen. Uh, he sends his warmest regards. He had an urgent family matter come up and was not able to attend. But I am personally really excited to be here with you. My background is industrial and systems engineering from Virginia Tech, but I decided I love data more. So I uh, spent nine years at Intel, started as an IE, moved into a technical analyst, and then moved over to being a data scientist. Um, I've been using SQL my whole career, but I've also picked up Python and JavaScript along the way. And in 2020, I found DuckDB. I was building a uh, uh, self-service analytics platform internally. We were using SQLite and Pandas for our on-the-fly transforms, and I was looking for something else. And I found DuckDB. It handled all the weird, weird SQL queries I could throw at it. It was much faster, and I loved it. Uh, and then I became probably the biggest DuckDB fan on all of Twitter, as you may know. Um, and at that point, the most millennial thing that's ever happened to me happened. Uh, a year later, Hannes uh, recruited me to then do some documentation and blogging for the DuckDB Foundation. So, uh, most millennial thing I've ever done. And about a month ago, um, I joined Mother Duck. And Mother Duck is a company that is taking DuckDB into the cloud. But one of the superpowers of DuckDB is it can run anywhere. So we're taking advantage of that at Mother Duck to have it run partially in the cloud, partially on your laptop, which means you'll get zero network latency some of the time. And you've already paid for your laptop, so any work we do on that CPU is totally free to you. But this talk is all about DuckDB, something I truly love. So what are we going to cover? We're going to talk about why DuckDB exists and how it will fit into the data science workflow. We'll talk about what is DuckDB at a high level, compare it to some of the alternatives. We'll, do, we'll take a quick look at a benchmark. You know, all benchmarks are, are biased, but we'll look at one. And we'll talk about what's under the hood, what makes DuckDB so fast. And we'll also talk about our integrations in the Python ecosystem. Finally, I've got a quick five-minute demo, and we will wrap things up. So before we even start, I want you to remember four things about DuckDB today. It's fast. Your time is important. Your scientists, your data folks, your time matters. If it wasn't fast, you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here. It's table stakes. Two, it's got to be easy. Because if it takes you two weeks to set up and has an ongoing maintenance burden, your time is lost there as well, and your time is very valuable. It's got to be easy. DuckDB is pip install DuckDB. Zero dependencies. It can run on any platform. It also works great with Python. So we've got deep integrations with Pandas, with PyArrow, even uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow. Uh, it's really important to us to partner with the Python ecosystem. And also, while the name in process doesn't sound like it handles larger than memory, that's actually one of the secret weapons of DuckDB. It's not an in-memory database, it's an in-process database. So we definitely handle larger than memory data, and we think of it as a superpower. Uh, you're no longer working with the 16 gigs of RAM that you've got, you're working with your one terabyte SSD. And that really gives you the power to crunch a lot more data to get done what you need done. So it's fast, it's easy. DuckDB loves Python more than RAM. So why does DuckDB exist? DuckDB is really a story of database researchers listening to data scientists and asking the question, so we've been working on databases for a couple decades, right? You guys use databases, right? And they got a lot of crickets, like, well, no, we, we don't really use databases. We have invented something called data frames, and we really love them, and here's why we love them. Wow, that's very interesting. We would have thought you'd use databases, right? So DuckDB is about marrying these two together and learning from each other and really working together. So if we look at this flow chart of a typical data science process, you're asking hypothesis. You've got to pull some data. Sometimes that's out of a SQL database. Other times it's flat files from all over the place, right? All kinds of formats, messy data. Then you want to explore it. You can explore it in data frames and databases. You really need to manipulate it and add that context and help that data really um, provide value. Then you're going to model that data. And when you do that, you'll probably do some forecasting, some machine learning, and that's probably in Python. And when you visualize it, that's probably in Python too. When's the last time you went to a database to go build a chart? Never. You're going to visualize it in Python. So parts of this workflow that you need to iterate through really, really quickly are already in Python. So why isn't your database? It's important that you can integrate with all these file formats, with the Python ecosystem, be fast, and also support flexible APIs. So DuckDB is a database. We do love SQL over in DuckDB, but we also respect and appreciate the data frame API. So we have a relational API, and we also have close partnerships with things like IBIS, things like Ponder, that will actually use DuckDB as the engine and have a data frame API on top. So truly the best of both. 
So a little bit more about what is DuckDB. DuckDB is really striving to be a new category of database. Uh, th these are two axes that you can bucket databases on. Uh, on the x-axis, you'll see transactional and analytical. Transactional is all about tons of tiny operations on your data, frequently very, very in parallel. Think, add an item to a shopping cart, remove it from a shopping cart, check out my shopping cart. Uh, many people are doing that all at once. It's got to be secure. It's got to be fast uh, for individual transactions. Analytical is, I want to look at my sales of the last two quarters and see which products are doing well and which ones I need to do more marketing for. So it's looking at a much larger swath of data, um, and it's a more analytical style query. Now on the other axis, on your Y, another way to categorize databases is in process and client server. So whenever I think database, I'm always thinking typically, okay, we got a server off somewhere, I'm gonna send in a message over a socket, probably over the network, it's gonna go crunch and then it's gonna send me back an answer. Uh, and that is the client server model. It's very popular. But believe it or not, even more popular is the in process model. SQLite is the champion here, where it's actually running within your process in your host language. And SQLite can be in almost any language at this point. It runs right alongside whatever else you're doing, um, and it's very compartmentalized that way. And it has some advantages. There's no server to manage. It works seamlessly with whatever you're working on. And it actually has very fast data transfer back and forth with what you're working on. So some key advantages of in-process. You notice there's a blank spot, right? That's by design. And truly, we believe that data scientists live in that blank spot for a long time, right? You're working in Python. You want to crunch your data in Python, and you need something analytical because you're crunching a ton of data. Up until then, there really wasn't a database for you. And we really believe and hope that DuckDB can be that database and can really be that Swiss Army knife that you need to crunch all the data you need in data science. So a bit more concretely, we call ourselves the SQLite of analytics. Uh, we're big fans of what SQLite has accomplished. We have 1.3 million downloads on PyPI per month. Uh, Python is one of our client libraries, but it's by far the most popular. It is free and open source, MIT license. So as Hannes likes to say, it's free as in free beer. So go build a company on it. How do you install it? It's pip install DuckDB. It's already pre-compiled for many, many platforms. It works cross-platform, even Windows. And um, pip install, no dependencies. Uh, it's embedded, so you're not managing any kind of server. It's just going to be running as if it's a library. As if you've imported pandas, you're importing DuckDB. Same idea. It's fast, as we talked about. And the secret power of being in process is that fast transfer back and forth. DuckDB can actually read a pandas data frame faster than pandas can read a data frame. We also have a very rich SQL dialect, and Rich is doing a lot of work there, right? I would call it a world-class, world-leading uh, SQL dialect, because not only are we, uh, did we fork the Postgres parser and use the most standardized parser out there, we've enhanced it to make it more lenient, more flexible, tells you exactly where your errors are, and we've actually taken the 50-year-old SQL syntax and pushed it forward. You can start your statements with from instead of select now. So you start with the table before you decide your columns. Uh, and a lot of real helpful UX things with SQL um, that you just don't get other places. It's also a single file format, so you can email your DuckDBs around, makes it a lot easier to manage. It also means that you can have multiple tables in the same file and store relationships about them. So if you have parquet files scattered everywhere, it's really tough to know how they relate to one another or how they join together. Uh, if it's all in one file, you can map those relationships concretely. We are in beta, we've been in beta for a little while, we're marching towards 1.0. I don't have a set date for you. So let's talk a little bit about some of the alternatives. Um, how would we kind of compare and contrast DuckDB? And really the goal here is to learn from both sides of things, the database research side as well as learn from the data science side. And, and we're aiming to be the best of both. If you need fast analytical queries, data frames are fantastic at that. There are analytical databases that are good at that already. Um, SQLite struggles with this. It's really excellent at transactions. It's not designed for analytics. They've made some different design decisions. For fast data transfer, if you're dealing with a client server protocol, it's not gonna be fast. If you're on the same machine, even sending it over the socket, that takes time. Uh, SQLite also, to read and run uh, analyses, has to write the data into SQLite before you can analyze it. Now, ease of use is also you know, a little bit in the eye of the, the beholder, but everyone um, would imagine that managing infrastructure is worse than not managing infrastructure. So that's really why where client servers are a little bit weaker. Data science integrations, um, if you look at any machine learning framework, do any of them accept a Postgres database as input? Do any of them take a pandas data frame as input? How about a NumPy array, right? The data science ecosystem thrives on the data frame and the array format. It's very important to integrate with that. Query optimization is something that some data frame libraries have really improved upon. 
Polars is one that's doing a lot of work in that area. But really, it's something that the, the database folks have a head start on. That's something they've been really focused on, doing a lot of research on for the last few decades. It's really their specialty. Now, something I didn't think too much about while I was working in Pandas uh, land, but built-in storage is not really part of a data frame library. It's kind of a, a build your own. You know, if you want to persist a data frame, you can save it as one parquet file. You save it as a thousand parquet files. You could do a nested hierarchy of parquet files. You could pickle it if you never want to update your Python or your pandas. But it's not built in. And the database has that um, to really keep things simple. Larger than RAM execution is also something that's pretty tough in a data frame world. Um, how many of you have crashed your Python process with pandas? Show of hands. All right, you're in the right place. Thanks for being here. I've, I've been there as well. Now, one key thing that data frames are really excellent at is really that relational API. Some things are great to do in SQL and some things aren't. And sometimes it's really nice to be able to just refer to a, a row by an index or, or do things in loops where you can loop over your columns, right? There's a benefit to a relational API. And so DuckDB meets you where you are. We've got SQL and that relational API. It's very important. SQL support, um, in some cases, some folks not, might not be super interested, but there's a whole lot of folks that the first step in their workflow in that, that flow chart is to pull data out of a SQL database. And so they may already come into the field with SQL skills. So having one tool that can meet both sides really means it's a lot easier to work in diverse teams. So we've made it this far. And we still haven't talked about why it's called DuckDB. Why is it called DuckDB? Well, ducks are very versatile, right? They're the envy of the animal kingdom. They can fly, they can walk, they can swim. They sit on the data lake. If only that were true. It is named DuckDB after Hannes's pet duck, Wilbur. Hannes lives in Amsterdam in a houseboat on the canal, and a dog on a houseboat is not a good fit. But a pet duckling is perfect. So DuckDB is named after an actual duck, and um, part of really the goal behind that as well is to be friendly and approachable, right? We're not super mega awesome DB. We're DuckDB because we want you to try it out, and we want to be a welcoming community. So let's talk about that speed, bullet one. Need to have it. So this is a benchmark from h2o.ai on data frame and data frame-like libraries. It's created several years ago, and one nice thing about this benchmark is it was not created by DuckDB, right? So it's relatively independent. Um, if you take a look at this, DuckDB is in first place across the board. If you're doing a, a group by on a billion rows, these, there's five separate queries in each of these categories, and they're run twice. So that 76 seconds means that it ran 10 queries on a billion rows in 76 seconds. That's pretty quick. If you want to do advanced questions, it's going to take a little bit longer. So those 10, 10 advanced queries are going to take you about 10 minutes. That's still very manageable, a lot of data crunching you can do. Likewise, on the joins, we're doing a 5 gig join example here. That's the largest that any of these libraries could pass. We're twice as fast as the nearest competitor. So really, while DuckDB, you know, our branding is about friendliness, we also really want to have some power under the hood. So let's look what's under the hood. We're going to cover a lot of the various design decisions made in DuckDB that help make it a fast analytical tool. And then we'll talk about how it integrates with the rest of Python. So to contrast that uh, with our data storage, we contrast a little bit with SQLite. SQLite is a traditional database in that it's a row store. It's very good if you want to pull out an entire row of data, say a shopping cart, right? I want all of my items in my shopping cart, all my attributes, all in one shot, right? And then I want to update it and I want to save it back. It's perfect. But what if I want to analyze those trends? Uh, you actually have to pull all rows and all columns because the data is stored together in memory for each row. And that can take a lot of time. DuckDB is columnar. This is similar to data frame libraries, right? We're going to be able to fetch individual columns off of disk. It really makes things a lot quicker if your query is targeted. So concretely, let's say you've got a one terabyte table. You've got 100 columns. They're all of equal size. You only care about five of them for this particular query. You're, you're experimenting right now, right? If you read all that data with a row store, it's going to take you three hours because you're going to read every single byte off of that disk. If it's at a column store, it's going to take eight minutes. It's really a difference from feasible, from infeasible to feasible. Likewise, compression can also make a very big difference. Um, over the course of a year and a half, DuckDB implemented compression in our column store. And because you're in a column structure, there's a lot of similar data back to back. You know, dates don't change that far, usually, when they're right next to each other. So we implemented a variety of things that compress integers, floats, and strings, and now data storage is three to five x more efficient in DuckDB. So concretely, back to that example, 
no longer taking eight minutes, pulling 50 gigs of data. If you're working with 10 gigs, it's taking under two minutes. You'd be hard pressed to get a cup of coffee in that amount of time. Another design decision uh, is contrasting kind of the method of execution. So SQLite is tuple at a time or row at a time. And this is fantastic in a constrained memory environment. Let's say you're running SQLite on an aircraft, because they are run on aircraft, right? Memory is precious. You want to pull something from disk, crunch it, send it back to disk. But if you're a data scientist, that's going to be very slow. Pandas does everything an entire column at a time. Uh, and this is much, much faster. It works much better with modern CPUs, with simultaneous instruction, multiple data. However, you're going to need a lot of RAM to do that. And your columns can get pretty big as, as your tables get longer. And this can also lead to some of those out of memory things we talked about before. DuckDB is really a Goldilocks approach. It's using vectorized processing. We do things in chunks of 2,048 rows. So that way we get the full advantage of your CPU's vectorization, but we also don't take up all your memory. We're also working very closely with your L1 cache of your CPU. So we do multiple operations on the same data back to back to back. So it never leaves that really fast cache right next to your CPU. It doesn't have to go all the way back out to RAM. So vectorization has additional benefits uh, in your CPU's memory hierarchy. Another thing that databases have really specialized in that DuckDB brings along is end-to-end -end query optimization. Uh, when you submit a SQL query, it's going to look at the whole plan and then decide what should I start with, rather than sequentially doing operations like traditional data frames. That can mean reordering your joins so there's not a combinatorial explosion uh, midway through your query. Um, it can also be filter and projection pushdown. That's what we see here. The very first step is only pull the rows and columns that you want. Uh, and that can be done manually in pandas, but most of the time I'm pulling the whole data frame in and, and then filtering it later, it can really slow me down. In the fast category and the easy category, DuckDB is going to automatically parallelize across all the cores on your machine. And it's going to do it in a very precise way, and you don't have to specialize, you know, specify any kind of partitions. It's going to do it fully automatically and keep your CPU fully loaded. Um, you can see in this example, it's an aggregation. It's scaling nearly linearly. It's going to really take good advantage of your processing horsepower. We also have in our back pocket larger than memory execution. So this is not just larger than memory as you pull in data. It's also intermediate calculations. Let's say you do a join and it, it's a big combination of things. We'll actually buffer things out to disk as we need. So the idea is also if you get close to that memory limit, not to get 10 times slower, 100 times slower, really to degrade gracefully and to make it just slightly slower but still finish. So we take inspiration from Galaxy Quest, never give up, never surrender. It'll take us a little more time, but we're going to get it done. So in this case, we went from 10 gigs of memory down to one. So one-tenth the memory. It's only two times slower. How does this fit into Python? We have ecosystem integrations ranging from data formats into data engineering libraries into data frame APIs, where you can write in data frame syntax and use DuckDB as the engine. It's the default in IBIS and in Ponder. Sayuba is a port of dplyr into Python syntax. It's also a great engine for visualization tools. Every tweak you make to a chart, every time you rotate it, change the type, those are data operations. They need to be fast. It's a perfect engine for that. We also have a SQL Alchemy dialect, so you can do your schema migrations and also integrate with the many, many tools that use SQL Alchemy, including JuPy SQL, which we'll see in our demo. Speaking of, demo time. All right, we're going to do a quick Hello World example. I'm here in Google Collab. Um, I don't even have to run pip install DuckDB because it is actually pre-installed in every Collab instance now. So all I need to do now is import DuckDB. And if I want to run a SQL statement, it is DuckDB.SQL, a string for my SQL command, and .fetchall, just like the typical Python database API. And I'll get my list of tuples back. In this case, it's 42, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Let's go a little more complicated. It's very important to be able to read files, not just run arbitrary SQL statements. So here we're going to pull a few files locally into the Collab Notebook. And in this case, we're not even using SQL. This is our relational API. Looks a lot like pandas pd.readcsv. Uh, and it's actually going to do the similar idea of it's going to detect all of your column names, detect all of your column types. Um, and then um, we can uh, use that without SQL. Likewise with JSON, it'll parse your JSON and bring it into separate columns uh, in DuckDB's fast storage format. Another nice trick that's up its sleeve is reading remote files, not just local files. Here we're installing a DuckDB extension, HTTP file system, and I can hit 
uh, I can pull a file from anywhere on the internet, right? Amazon S3, uh, I can pull it from Google Cloud. Every single file on GitHub, I can hit with one line of code from path to file. Works for CSV, JSON, Parquet, even directories of Parquet. You put an asterisk in there, it'll grab all the Parquet files in that folder. So super powerful as a Swiss Army knife tool. And here we're actually using .df at the end, and that's all it takes to be right back in Pandas. Return the answer back to the Pandas data frame, I'm back in Python land. So let's do a little bit more with Pandas. Uh, I'm gonna create a data frame here, and then I'm gonna go ahead and run on that data frame. And it's as easy as select star from my data frame. We actually look in the Python locals, we look for objects of the class data frame, and we know how to read them, we just get the pointer to where they are, and we just read them. Don't even have to insert them into the database first. We're in the same memory space because we're in process, and that's really that superpower. You can do more than just read it though, you can do more complex calculations, and here's an example of some of the friendlier SQL syntax. We're starting with the from clause, because that's what I always do first, right? Where am I getting my data, what's my table? I always start with from. And so now you can actually write it with from in, in the front. Um, next thing is we're gonna do select star replace. So if I had a table with 100 columns and I only wanted to modify one of them, if you're writing SQL in any other dialect, you're gonna have to put all 99 right there with no changes and then change the last one. Well, here you just do select star replace. It's way more friendly for interactive exploration, especially if you've got dynamic column names. We have similar integrations with PyArrow. We can read and we can write. So we can read all kinds of PyArrow objects, record batch readers, tables, and we can output back as a table with just changing to dot arrow at the end. Let's do one more example here. If you are in a Jupyter context, we actually have some extra nice features here uh, from the JuPy SQL folks where you can have better syntax highlighting and better integration with Jupyter. So JuPy SQL is a fork of IPython SQL. It's a way to run individual SQL cells in a Jupyter notebook. So in this case, I'm setting up the extension. I always want pandas as my result. And I'm connecting with a standard SQL Alchemy connection string to an in-memory DuckDB. And then I can do percent percent SQL, select 42, and I get my answer back. But what's nice is that's syntax highlighted, um, and it's a lot nicer to work with uh, just as plain SQL as a SQL cell. Um, I can do the same tricks, pull from uh, a file from the internet, and here I'm actually loading it back into a data frame back into pandas. So we have um, you know, pip install DuckDB one line, import DuckDB another line, and, and one line we're, we're writing SQL against any file uh, or data frame we need. All right, in summary, what are the four things? It's fast, otherwise, why do it? Multi-core, it's vectorized to use your modern CPU, and it's in process so your data transfer is instant. It's easy, pip install, MIT license, build anything you want on top of it, contribute back, we'd love to work with you. There's no server, we've got a friendly SQL dialect, and it's not just SQL, we have a relational API. It works great with Python, and we care about it. DuckDB loves Python, it's our most popular client, we really wanna learn from you guys. It also handles larger than RAM data. So never give up, never surrender. And with that, I believe I'm out of time. Thanks very much, and welcome to the flock. Thank you, Alex. We'll start with a virtual question, and then um, Glenn will be walking around. Glenn is the co-chair for the session. Hi, Glenn. Um, Glenn will be walking around with a microphone, so raise your hand, and she will come and bring a microphone to you. Um, okay, so uh, we have a couple of sub-questions. I'm just going to start with one. Um, well, maybe I'll try to read the whole thing. It's a little long, okay? Sure, sure. Um, so we have a question from Shabham Ja. Um, how well does it handle sparse data? We generally face problems when one hot encoding increases dimensionality of the data frame, which in turn increases the compute time. Um, and then there's another part. Has there been any instances where data compression has resulted in any kind of data slash information loss? No, and then, I can say no on that one off the bat. Okay, no on that one on, off the bat, but do you still have the sparse, uh, the sparse data? And then, um, Finally, you mentioned that DuckDB has integration with data lakes like AWS S3. Um, Pandas is pretty slow when querying directly from S3. Is DuckDB any faster? Gotcha, well, thank you, thank you. On the sparse side, because we are a columnar structure, we do have some benefits there. Uh, we break our rows into row group chunks, so somewhere around 
100,000 rows in a chunk. So if you really have nothing in that chunk, we can compress it down to a single value and just basically say, you know, run length encoding, we've got, you know, one value here and it is a certain length. Um, we do also do some other compression uh, types, but width of columns, I don't think we have any kind of hard limit. Uh, I'd love to see how far we can push it. I think we can push it pretty far. Um, the S3 side, I'd have to check if it's any faster. We do have our, our own custom Parquet reader and our own custom HTTP file system, so it is a totally separate implementation, so it's quite possible it's, it's faster. Let's benchmark it. Thanks for the question, everybody. Any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. Yep. Hey, um, this sounds really interesting. I think uh, DuckDB sounds really cool. I, I'm not a huge fan of pandas, um, but I'm just curious, coming at, coming at it from kind of like maybe a no free lunch attitude, are there any data science workflows where you've kind of ran into like maybe DuckDB isn't for you or you're doing something where this doesn't really work out? Um, yeah, anything you've encountered there or maybe the answer is just no, <laughs> I'm not sure. I wouldn't say no. There's there's a reason we integrate tightly with Python because there's a lot you can do in Python that's hard to do anywhere else, right? You know, we're not planning on building, you know, machine learning into our database because why do that if it's excellent in Python? So there's absolutely an integration point where we want to pass things back into Python and back and forth. Um, some things we do try and handle dynamic column names as much as we can, but you're always going to be more flexible in pandas with that. So if you want to do one hot encoding, um, that might be best done in pandas. That's a one-liner in pandas. That'd be great. Um, some of your other kind of loop over all of your columns. Sometimes that's nicer in pandas. So um, yeah, we believe in back and forth. Great question. Thank you. Got another audience question. Hey, uh, I'm Rafael. Uh, great talk. Um, I actually uh, have started already playing with DuckDB for a little bit, and uh, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Things Get have been swag. pretty smooth. <laughs> and <Goes> for everyone. <laughs> thanks. Uh, uh, one question, though. Uh, do you have any advice or recommendations for, like, once you want to start scaling out to having other users on your team also use DuckTB in a multi-write capacity, like, do you have any thoughts there, recommendations, or best to avoid it? Uh, you know. It's a great question. So the superpower of being in process does mean that we are within that process. So that that is probably the trade-off. I could have put a row in that that had a a no in there for DuckTB of of multiple writes at the same time. We do not support that. So a lot of what we see users do is persist to Parquet as a, as a format, and then they can use Parquet as a way of managing that access. Uh, we're adding Iceberg support in the next release, so that's another great way to manage multi-user um, uh, locking. And then um, other ways we have it, it's actually in the FAQ on our site, because um, I wrote that FAQ because I've had that question many times, and it's a great question, and it deserves a good answer. So you can do other things like have a central server that, um, you know, just a, a lightweight web server that's just, you know, doing one connection at a time. Uh, you can do things like that. Um, often what I'll see is have your data in Parquet and every request for your data gets its own DuckDB, right? You get a DuckDB, you get a DuckDB. You get a DuckDB, you get a DuckDB. Everyone gets a DuckDB. Okay, one more question. Uh, you mentioned you don't have a date for 1.0 yet. Uh, what is the roadmap? Or in your opinion, what are the big holes that you still need to plug there? Sure. Um, We've got a huge test suite. You know, millions of queries are run, fuzzers are run, so really the stability is great. The last remaining piece is to kind of iron out the storage and make sure that we want to, we, we're going to be 1.0 and we want to have backward compatibility to that point with the storage. So that's something that's really tough to change once you lock it in, in your storage format. You know, once you save a file, it's around for a long, long time. So we're being very careful about that. Because our storage is not just the data, it also has your indexing structures, your foreign key, primary keys. There's a lot that we store and we wanna make sure that we kind of have a, a storage format that's set for the future. So each release, we've been tweaking the storage less and less and less, and we're getting ready to kind of say, okay, this is the DuckDB file format, we're 1.0, here we go. Uh, it's been on, it's been a this year thing probably for one to two years, but this year, I can't promise anything. But we're working on it, and that's uh, storage is really the last piece. Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. All right, please get some swag on your way.